Hi everyone, it is Hugo Bound Anderson here. I am so excited to uh, welcome you to today's fireside chat about natural language processing from prototype to production with Inez uh, Montani. Uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, if you're able to introduce yourself in the YouTube chat uh, and let us know where you're calling in from, um, uh, what your interest is in machine learning and natural language processing, uh, and moving from prototype to production, what type of work you do, uh, that would be super cool. Um, and we're we're triply, quadruply as excited as, as usual today uh, because this is our first fireside chat uh, that we're doing in the European time zone. So for everyone who's missed out previously, so excited to have you here today. And we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Hi everyone, it's Hugo Ban Anderson here. Very excited to have you here today. So great to already have uh, just shy of 80 people on online uh, excited for our fireside chat with Inez Montani about natural language processing, uh, moving from prototype to production and all the different things uh, about NLP. Um, it's really cool to see people dialing in uh, from, from Berlin, from Paris, from Morocco, from Dublin, from India, from, from Nigeria people who work in uh, NLP um, and also work in other, uh, other types of machine learning and, and data science. Um, Ivan from Switzerland working on utilizing NLU to work with uh, intellectual property documents, fascinating. Um, we have people working in industry. We have Ravanesh uh, from Dusseldorf, Germany, who's a master's student. So we have people working, people studying, people learning, um, people working in information retrieval. This is all incredibly exciting. Hey, we've got someone from Melbourne, Australia as well great great to have you here um and we have jennifer sampson from london an nlp practitioner working in energy as well so um we're going to take a couple more minutes for everyone to get in hi igor from the netherlands great to have you here um and we'll get started in uh two minutes all right All right, everyone, it's time to get started. I'm, I'm too excited to, to wait any, any more minutes. Um, so without further ado, um, Ines, why don't we turn our cameras on and have a chat? Yeah, hi. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, good, um, good morning, everyone in um, the exactly. EU. Good, good evening morning. in Australia. And, and good evening in Australia and good day or good day, as we say, um, from the whole spectrum in between. I actually had a friend once who, in an Australian friend, he was actually born in Israel, but he, um, we we're in Europe together and he tried to turn G'day into different European uh, versions of it. So he actually, we we're in Berlin and he tried to say Gitag to German people and he <laughs> oh, just God. got, and he got the, the most ridiculous stares, of, of course. And he tried Bajua in Paris and Badias <laughs> in Spain. The Spanish were most receptive. To, to Badia. Yeah, this, but, this stuff only works in Australian English. Yeah, yeah exactly. I've no, you had my fair share of it's, experience with <laughs> Australians as well. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so it is so great to have you here, Inez, today. Yeah, um, for having me. 
such a pleasure. And I just want to welcome everyone who's joined. We've already got 100, uh, over 120 people have, have wow. joined already. So very humbled and excited that you're all interested in, in, in such things. Um, so we're going to chat for an hour uh, or so. And then after, we're actually going to have um, an, an async ask me anything. So if there are questions that arise, please put them in the chat, everyone. Uh, but if we don't get to all, all of them, feel free to come to our Slack here, which I'll paste in the chat. Um, and Inez and I will both be answering any questions you have in there's a channel there called a a AMA, AMA Guests. Um, and oh, we've got we've got some a bunch of people from Australia as well. Um, and we have <laughs> a number of people saying kudos, such lovely things as kudos to the team, developing Spacey and Prodigy, rock solid and great oh. documentation, which um oh, thank you. <laughs> and I, I actually I was I was gonna get to this, but as you know, I I, I work on the Metaflow team and at, at, at Out of Bounds. Um, and the people who started Metaflow, my, my colleagues actually would, were deeply inspired by, by Spacey in the early days of Metaflow in particular, the documentation and the human centric design has just been an in, in inspiration. And they, oh, they, they were so nice excited about this. Yeah. Yeah. These are definitely things that were important to us that we put a lot of work into. So yeah, it's always great to see when these things resonate. Absolutely. Um, and so just a little bit, um, it's, we're hosting this fireside chat and at Out of Bounds, we work on kind of similar kind of philosophy to, to you at, at, at um, Explosion and on Prodigy and Spacey. We, we work on infrastructure and productivity tools for data scientists to kind of allow data scientists to focus building on models and doing data science while having easy access to all the infrastructural layers. Um, and if you're interested in checking out anything we do, I actually, I work in DevRel and build a lot of educational material. Um, so I'm actually going to put in the chat. Uh, sorry, someone's just commented when I said bonjour that Hugo, your French is perfect. That is, that is brilliant. <laughs> um, so I'm putting in the chat some resources for data scientists that we have where we th really think about the full stack of machine learning. Um, and we also have um, a lot of tutorials, including an NLP tutorial. So I thought to drop that in as well, if anyone is is interested um and the obligatory um hit subscribe and share with friends if you think it will interest them um wherever that i mean it's down there it's down there somewhere <laughs> um but without further ado i'd love to i'd love to jump in and i'll i'm going to introduce you um but then it would be great to kind of hear about your trajectory and what you're working on now and you can correct me in any of my introduction but um it is montani i'm sure you'll do here. a great job <laughs> Um, well, you helped me with the bio, I think, as well. So is a software developer working on AI and NLP technologies. Um, she's the co-founder and CEO of Explosion, where they make Spacey, one of the leading open source libraries for NLP in Python and Prodigy, a modern annotation tool for creating training data for machine learning models. Is that, okay. did I do pretty well? That's, that's how I would summarize uh, what I'm doing exactly. Yeah, and on, on top of that, we do a lot of work in open source, a lot of related libraries. We're currently working on um, an extension product for Prodigy, which runs partly in the cloud and addresses the need of scaling up annotation projects and data collection projects, collaborating. Um, so that's coming very soon. I know we've been saying this for a long time, but like, it's really true now. Um, Fantastic. So that's very exciting. And um, yeah, we're always interested in helping people solve real world NLP problems in the wild um, and also yeah, using um, the latest things that come up in research and then translating them into something that can be useful um, or seeing what, what's interesting, what's promising. And once it's more mature, how can we use that in creative ways to make people's lives easier? Amazing. I'm, I'm so excited to jump into all of that, in particular, kind of how to bridge the gap or how you think about bridging the gap between NLP and research and what happens in production and in industry. I know there are a lot of online resources for people to do NLP in, in notebooks and, 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 and that type of stuff. But then what is actually how do, how do you move from prototype to production and how those things are interrelated? Um, but before all of that, maybe you could set the stage a bit by um, telling us what, what's happening and what you do at Explosion and a bit about Spacey and Prodigy. I mean, I, I presume a lot of our audience knows, knows about Spacey and Prodigy, but for those who, who may not, it'd be great to get the elevator pitch. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, I, this is not going to be the elevator pitch, but um, I will just talk about uh, Spacey and Prodigy. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, the YouTube well, available. Spacey, yeah, Spacey is um, an open source library in Python. It was um, initially started in 2015, which is quite a while ago. 
and the inspiration was my co-founder Matt he did a PhD in the field before it was called AI and he started noticing that more and more companies were interested in using his research code and um, wanted to license it and he was like well no this is like research code research code is supposed to um, print a number and exit this is not what you should use in production but it basically showed like hey finally these technologies are starting to work there's really a gap here for a library that's focused specifically on production use cases that's fast efficient has a good uh, developer experience and that's kind of how Spacey was born and I joined the project shortly after for a long time it was a very small team developing the library um, and yeah the focus has always been to provide practical components and also take an opinionated approach, um, provide one model or like one implementation that is the best and has the best trade-offs between mm -hmm. speed, accuracy, customizability, while also making it easy for power users to extend the library with anything custom. And that can range from like implementing a super new machine learning model implementation um, to doing something more quote unquote, um, uh, old fashioned, like, hey, just adding some rules and some rule based extraction, because there are areas where, hey, this just works much better. You don't need machine learning for everything, uh, but you want to combine it all in one API uh, that you can work with. So that's that was the philosophy of Spacey. And um, then, yeah, very, very early on, we realized machine learning, it's not just code, it's not just algorithms it's always code plus data. And mm. once you're serious about doing it, you always want to have your own data and do something custom. That's also where the value is. Like most value is delivered in stuff that's quite specific to a use case. Yeah. And so we actually, we needed an annotation tool internally. Um, so we built one that we would like to use that's also a developer tool. And that's how Prodigy was born. And um, that became our first commercial product. And it is a developer library, but it also comes with a UI for annotating um, different types of data and um, from text to images now to even audio and something fully custom. And the idea is really to make the whole process efficient so you can iterate faster, really focus on, hey, collecting the most important information, putting a model in the loop because data development, it's like code development. It's not static. You need to keep mm. doing it. Ideally, even the machine learning developer needs to keep doing this. We had the vision um, very early on, like, hey, imagine you have a great idea for something new you want to build. Imagine if you could just go, nowadays, you don't need so much data anymore. You can collect a few hundred examples, run an experiment, and see if your idea works. That's awesome. And um, for that, you need a tool that works efficiently and fits into your workflow. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of where Prodigy fits in. And for those who don't know, can you tell us a bit about what annotation is and how it may differ from, I'm oh, yeah. everyone's aware of what labeling is, but how it may differ from? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think these terms are often used interchangeably, but basically, I mean, the, the, the rough, the, the fundamental idea is, well, um, if, if you're doing machine learning or supervised machine learning, one idea, one, one way of telling, you all, I pretty much always want to tell the computer what to do. That's kind of one of the great things about programming and building things. Um, you need a way of telling the computer what to do. And mm -hmm. one way of that is, well, using a programming language. Another way in machine learning is to use data. So you basically show um, the model and the training algorithm what you want it to output, ideally. And then you train your model. And um, at the end of it, um, ideally, it should have generalized enough that it can do the exact same on unseen data. So that could be, yep. hey, you want to apply labels to a text. Um, you want to extract certain spans of text, like person names from a text. Um, those are all uh, options. You want to have relationships of a text or cluster concepts in a text together, like the mention of a name and pronouns that refer to that name. Um, there's basically, there's kind of no shortage of what you can do. Um, mm. But the, the important uh, question is, what should you do? And often that's not clear just like programming it's very rare that like the first idea you have for how to write something is the right uh, way and you never end up refactoring your code that's uh, usually not true and often the same goes for your NLP pipeline there are lots of different ways to break it down and you have to find the right one yeah so this was Prodigy then when did Explosion come come into the picture uh so Explosion started in 2016 so kind of uh, in between Spacey and Prodigy Right. Um, so we 
um, yeah, we realized like when I started working on Spacey, um, we realized like, hey, there are actually a lot of cool opportunities here for a company. And um, we decided to bootstrap the company and uh, stay independent um, for a long time. Also to show like, hey, there's a lot of, there is a lot of interest in the field. There's no need uh, to be running at a loss initially. Um, yep. We want to see what the market is like. We took on some consulting projects early on um, to fund uh, the development of Prodigy, also to get some connection with real world problems. And um, yeah, then we developed Prodigy um, and that was the commercial product that we were able to fund the company on. And then when we got serious about finishing up um, or like when we you know, were at a point where things were going well and we're like, now all we need is finishing up that um, extension for pro product for Prodigy or kind of the next iteration. Um, we um, That's the first time we took investment and we sold 5% of the company initially to be able to hire a larger team and mm. get the product out and over the finish line. And that's kind of where we're at now. Great. And how many people are you now at Explosion? Um, so now we're just under 30 um, okay. at the moment. So it's still, I, I guess, you know, relatively small, but I think it's also for software. Um, mm. You know, we don't necessarily believe that bigger teams ship better software. Um, I think even within like big tech companies, um, a lot of the software is actually built by smaller teams. Um, it's, I, you know, you know, you, yeah. you need, a, need the right team um, and the right ideas. That's more important than I just more people. I couldn't agree more. And I think um, edges in the graph as you try to scale a company need to be, need to be very mindful of, I've always, I always ask whether a hundred people can build more than 10 people. And I think if you, especially if you grow very quickly, I, I think it's very unlikely yeah. that you. Yeah. That no, you and also one person can only have so many direct reports. Like as soon as yeah, you yeah. Yeah, get more people in, you get more managers in and then, yeah, you, you have to you end up delegating things further down the line. And I think that just, yeah, it also didn't really fit to the philosophy we had also being like two founders who are um, very hands-on in the beginning. And we're both programmers. We're both technical we're both Absolutely. developers, so yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to get too much into bureaucracy and these types of things, but it is, <laughs> having worked for several startups now, it is a, a fascinating point um, in a startup's trajectory when middle management uh, emerges and how, how mindful you need to be of that emergence and who you put in those, yep. the, those middle layers. It can be a, a make or break time in, in a lot of ways. Um, but enough about the, the bureaucracy of, of growing and hyperscaling startup life. Um, this, this is a, kind of a relatively naive question, I think, in a lot of ways, but I think it can be um, fruitful for the rest of our conversation. Could you give us a rundown of just what NLP, natural language processing, is and, and why, it's, why it's important and why it seems to have been a, a adopted all over the place? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's actually, it's not even such a naive or bad question because I, I also feel like people often use the term to mean slightly different things. So... Um, it, I think I would say in general, it's natural language processing is processing text that comes in in the form of natural language. Natural which language. Sure most of you would have um, guessed. Um, so, you know, using a computer to analyze text and um, also in ways that goes often goes beyond uh, just searching for keywords. Um, I think some people, I think nowadays, usually what's also grouped into that field is um, natural language generation and natural language understanding. Um, you know, understanding is more like, hey, we take, we get this natural language in and we wanna have some structured output. The generation, that's also what I'm sure everyone is familiar with. Hey, you have like a, a model and that outputs text um, or even something like translation. I think that's usually seen under the same umbrella, but what we focus on is much more on the level of natural language understanding and information extraction. I think that's because that's also one area um, that's incredibly important um, across all kinds of business use cases and where even currently a lot of value can be delivered because I think one situation we have is, hey, we've been as humans, we've been amassing text over like a very long time. And as um, you know, we become more digit digitalized, we keep amassing more and more and more text. The internet keeps growing. Um, we have a lot of text and we want to analyze it in ways that we couldn't necessarily do manually, either because we have way too much for a human to even read or because, yeah, we want to extract things and connections that also are not viable for humans um, to extract by just reading text and keeping track of everything 
um, that's happening and what everything means. So, um, and I think that's also why it's um, so important um, and yeah, why people have found it useful. We're at a point where a lot of these things actually work, like really work, not just like theoretically work and um, are actually useful even just to um, automate some processes that previously had to do had to be done manually or in combination with humans because humans and machines fundamentally make different mistakes so if you're only yeah humans can be inattentive humans um can be um lazy humans um yeah humans don't have a great memory and then you have machines that make mistakes that sometimes make us go like what like how mm. how do you make that prediction but um it, when it comes to consistency um and um memory um yeah um we can't beat a machine so both of that together basically leads to better results and i think that's that's also why nlp has been pretty successful yeah great and what and i know the answer may be a, a lot of industries now but what industries do you find nlp being most relevant to and how what mm -hmm. what type of things do they do with with, with nlp yeah, I mean, it's really, as you said, it's, it's really um, most industries, like when pe people often ask, like, hey, which industries? And I'm like, well, I can't, I can barely think of an industry that's, um, you know, not using our tools. So that's not using NLP. And I think we've also seen that when you did the quick intro of uh, people in the chat, we already had like, yeah. what, like five different industries come up, even just in the very beginning. Um, but of course, they're like the more classic use cases of B2C um, applications, startups, e-commerce that maybe more people think of where, hey, you have product descriptions or you have text and emails coming in from users, from customers that you need to categorize, analyze. Um, that's one area we have um, legal. Um, legal has a lot of text. Um, that's also very obvious. There's contracts. That's all, it's mm. also, um, also a field where, um, you know, it really mistakes um, can be very costly and can lead to a lot of problems. So, um, being able to work more efficiently with large and large volumes of text um, that's often also follows, I would say, a, a, often a structured approach, but also a very formulaic, like it's language in itself. Um, that's also where NLP can be very successful, um, even just pointing out, hey, here's something that's weird. Maybe you want to check that again or um, resolve references to other legal concepts um there's like there's a lot there medical um again there there's a lot of work there's a, there are a lot of studies there's a, a lot of material um a lot of very specific con concepts that can be extracted you can talk about um uh, you know research of new drugs um effects patient notes um from doctors everything's text often also yeah if you go into the sort of healthcare area a lot of it is just written in all like in all kinds of unstructured ways notes a doctor typed about a patient um follows no consistent structure and yeah. somehow you want to standardize that um digitalize that there's a lot um finance um again it's similar use cases to legal but also there's stuff like for financial um, modeling and um, financial work, following the news, following what's happening in the world is very important. You want to extract stuff or company reports. What do you know? companies uh, publish? Often there's a lot of actually interesting stuff is often hidden somewhere in fine print um, and not nicely formatted in a table, um, often on purpose. So you have like this natural, natural language you want to um, resolve there following what's happening in the world, analyzing news, seeing what's going on, um, trying to um, understand, um, you know, new trends. If you're, you know, from Federal Reserve banks setting interest rates, they need to know what's going on. That's like uh, to um, people uh, trying to find, predict supply chains. Um, hey, there's a strike in this specific area in the world. And that's like 10 levels removed from something else I'm buying. Yeah. How can this disrupt? Like these are, these are, for example, these are use cases of, that sound boring, but actually are incredibly valuable. Similar with Absolutely. like traditional manufacturing. You have a manufacturing plan for the past decades. Engineers have been writing up word documents of what's been going wrong 
when there was an incident and you have all of that and now you want to have put that in a, in a database. Sounds a bit lame, but actually huge, huge value. It's incredibly important and, and valuable and impactful, as, as you say. Yeah. So I'm really interested in getting into now what, what NLP looks like in, in, in production as opposed to NLP in research. And then, as, as we said before, there are a lot of resources online for... Um, learning about how to do NLP in notebooks and that type of stuff. But how, how do these things differ from when, when you're building NLP models in, in production, in industry? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to necessarily say notebooks are bad. I mean, there's a lot of, Not um, at all. There's a lot of you know, sh shitting on notebooks. Ultimately, it's just a different computing environment. But of course, I think when most people say, hey, what, what people mean by notebooks is, oh, you just kind of copy paste some stuff together or hack something together to have a proof of concept. And um, of course, that's, yeah, and then often the challenge is, hey, how yeah. do you take that so, and put it into production? Yeah. And my intention wasn't to disparage. No, I, I think I, <laughs> no, I, I know, I know. To, to, to prototype, um, for, for example. Um, and I know people yeah. who use notebooks in, in, in production as well. I'm not, I'm not one, of, one of those. But um, and as yeah, you yeah, may yeah. know, Out of Bounds came out of ne Netflix or the software came, came out of Netflix yeah. that, that we work on. And they use a lot of notebooks in production. So, yeah. Oh, notebooks yeah. in production. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think. Um, so basically, I mean, if we, if we just look at like a lot of a lot of what we're working with in industry comes out of research, and that's like that's um, super important. So a lot of the ideas were first developed in research, and um, one aim of research is to kind of build a commons of knowledge and um, solve uh, hard hard problems and kind of um, you know come up with new ways um, to solve um, you know very specific tasks and um, uh, find um yeah find kind of find gen have you know general solutions work on the algorithms and um kind of on the other side you have like actually taking the taking that work and taking the commons of knowledge and using that in a real world uh yeah. setting and um often um you know there you actually have want to find solutions that are very very specific to a given problem. Like you have a business need that you want to solve end to end and you want to, um, you know, you want to do this and you want to find the solution uh, that works best. Um, and, uh, you know, often you also have very different considerations for um, speed, accuracy, um, you know, you or also the um, trade-offs between the two um, and even just the, the question of like, what should you even do in the first place? Um, I think often, um, you know, if you just if people come into the field and follow both like research and industry, it can be a bit um, misleading or, or it can be a bit uh, confusing to see latest models uh, come out or like oh some accuracy numbers that are reported in papers, and then trying to decide hey sh should I re replicate that on that, this paper? Why does this not work for my thing? And it's like well these are fundamentally different objectives, and it doesn't mean research should focus more on solving business problems like that's mm. business problems are um can often be quite simple you can also you can make you can make your problem easier like you need to you want to find the easiest best solution um to your problem um and decide how um to break it down into components that you can easily solve that you can reliably develop um that you can maintain um and yeah, that that run and serve serve the purpose that you're interested in. Great, and I'm I'm also interested, and in, there there are some people asking stuff like this in in, in the chat um, around how you think about the types of skills needed to move from working in notebooks to deploying models, the the, the software stack that Spacey in, in, interoperates with, how to think about integrating your models with larger software business systems and, and, and all of these types of considerations? Um, the, the skills you need. Yeah, I do think having good software development skills is often even more important than having like learning a specific library or a specific library API. I think it's it's kind of like, you know, yeah, you, it's, it's almost a bit like, yeah, programming languages more generally. If you have like, if you good at like one programming language and you try to sort of get into another one, um, you can often pick up the concepts uh, much more easily. Whereas like, oh, if you're kind of limited to just knowing how to do a thing with a certain library that can help um, you solve problems quickly. But once you want to get a bit deeper, um, 
you know, you, you can easily feel stuck. So stuck. So I think the kind of being able to write decent code is a good skill to have. And it's also um, something you could pick up and um, something, you know, that means, um, yeah, you have like more prospects in your role and can go beyond just um, building the prototypes because otherwise, you know, you can just, if you're building a prototype and that prototype can't actually be used at all, and someone else then has to go and rewrite it um, entirely to make it um, at all useful. That's maybe something that can work in a really large team, but that's not really sustainable um, in a small organization. So I think that's um, um, that's definitely helpful, general programming. And also, um, if you're working um, with text, I do think a bit of uh, linguistics and really understanding language can go a long way. Um, mm. like yes people um, because it, no matter even if you're working with the you know large language models or the you know something that um, you know in, inherently doesn't look like you know you're analyzing language or you're writing rules about language understanding how language works conceptually and having like a basic understanding of linguistic concepts can help because it also helps you design your solution better like you don't need to be you know do a phd in linguistics and you don't need to um go super deep but they are uh, fundamentally we do like if we're looking at natural language the grammar and the constructions in the language and the syntax that we use is a big part of how we express what we want to get across and are a part of how we convey meaning in the text so um, if you're thinking about, hey, how do I can how can I extract certain concepts from a text in a consistent way? It can help to understand. Oh, okay, these are sort of these are units, syntactic units in the text. These are consistent. Mm. These other things are not. So if you have your model and it like outputs arbitrary phrases that can be kind of anything from you know proper nouns like a name to parts half half sentences and just anything arbitrary that like. This is very hard to compute with. Like, yes, you can maybe train something like that, but at the end of it, you get something out that's like, does it actually help you? Like, um, how how do you, how do you go from there? You can have a model that yeah. can extract everything that's interesting to you, but then usually the next that's usually not the last step. Usually, then you want to put it in a database. You want to relate it to something else. And so, thinking about um, you know how language breaks down. I think is often helpful, and it's often the, I think it's often the type of thing that some people might feel like they're missing. Like there is sort of, or sometimes we see that when talking to people, there's often this vibe of like there is this secret source that like I feel like oh I don't I don't have for NLP that like oh could take for me sure. to the next level. And I think it's not actually that deep, and it's often not like oh the the super in depth details about the model that often doesn't even met, matter. Um, that significantly it's it's the first step is about breaking down the problem into something you can solve and into things you can extract and how like how you go from a larger business problem to um actually an nlp pipeline that extracts something um and if that is bad then I'll, any like yes you can do some hyperparameter tuning and like throw some larger and larger embeddings at it and maybe you get some more accuracy out but mm. that's kind of that's kind of not what matters here like um you know if if you date like your data needs to be good your approach needs to be good your idea needs to be right exactly um, understanding and, yeah. how your data is generated and on top of that i mean where my mind also goes is that we're kind of talking around having more domain expertise as, as well, right? Like understanding yep. the specifics of the language you're, you're dealing with um, and your ability to understand it and understand what features are important. If you need to do any feature engineering, which you, you, you likely do at some point, and that will be a lot more, have a lot greater lift for you in whatever models you build than some hyperparameter tweaks. Yeah. Um, and just, we've got a great comment that, that I like, and I want to kind of drill down into this slightly that, um, Software development is underrated and machine learning is overrated, relatively <laughs> speaking. Um, and what I what I take from that is a lot of the conversations we have in the space are around the powers of, of machine learning, but um, having good software development best practices is incredibly important, particularly as we're trying to tell more and more of um, the deployment story these days. We do have a question related to this. I want to get into what 
applied NLP thinking really is um, in, in, in a minute. But we do have an interesting question around the problems, technical details of the problems that one might, might face uh, while deploying, such as debuggability, versioning, uh, throughput, optimized scoring. I'm, I'm wondering in your mind, what are the, the big things you see when moving from prototype to, to production um, in terms um, of te technical challenges? Technical challenges. Um, yeah, I mean, um, like most, mostly, I think what we mostly focused on is, is, is kind of is a bit, starts a bit earlier before that. So it's like, okay, we've, you know, we're definitely using a lot of kind of ML, ML ops stuff, but that's also kind of not the area. Um, mm. we're in. I think there's definitely, yes, there's obviously um, ideas of like, okay, how do we, um, you know, how do we yeah, surf, surf the thing, make it stable? How do we, um, you know, improve latency? Um, they're actually the, the trade-offs here. Yes, people always want like the most accurate solution, but if the most accurate solution is too slow, that's, um, yeah, that's a problem. And then it's about finding the right trade-off. Um, but I think also the kind of continuous um, development and the kind of iterative improvement because it's one yeah. thing you know a lot of people just a lot of talk is about like okay you have you take your model you put it into production into your fancy cluster or however you do that and have like all your nice ml ops tooling around um and then it runs but then how do you go from there to improve it because most likely your data will change even the world will change like there are very few industries that are completely immune from yeah, the world around us and the language changing, like references change. Even if you're, even if everything you're working with is about your company, your comp stuff in your company changes, your products change, your suppliers change. Like there's there's stuff that's just different, yeah. and um, you want to have this continuous loop of actually making sure um, you can catch wrong predictions and evaluate them, see where the problems are, analyze them generate more data, improve the model, and then also make sure you're actually not making the model worse um, this way. And I think a lot of that is, um, there's a lot of tooling you can use around that, but I think some of this again also comes down to just a more fundamental reasoning about let's say evaluation uh, methods and just data. Like, um, you know, if, you're, if your evaluation data is shit, you, it's really easy to get 99% accuracy. That does not mean your model is great. So um, yeah, I think that's exactly. also often something that's not talked about a lot. So you do want um, yeah, a representative sample and representative examples that you can test your model on so that you can be really sure that changes you deploy actually make it better and not worse. Absolutely. And, and there was yeah. something you, you, you said in there that I think really plays into how you think about um, applied NLP thinking. You, you can have a very, a very accurate model that's super slow and may not work in a, in a business context, right? So you've got yeah. a wonderful blog post that, that I'll share um, called Applied NLP Thinking, if, <laughs> yep. if, I, if I recall correctly. Um, yep. And part of it is thinking, the linguistics is actually part of it. And, and this is an, like an, a valuable part of, part of a skill set. But one of the points you you make, um, and I'll say it poorly, I'll paraphrase you and then you can I expound on it, um, is that um, whereas research is optimizing for accuracy and some form of ground, gr ground truth, um, in, in business, we want things that are useful a lot of the time. These things, there is sometimes an impedance mis mismatch here. So maybe you can tell us a, a bit about what you mean by applied NLP thinking and why you even started to think about this. Um, yeah, so I think, well, we, yeah, we started thinking about it because, yeah, it's just something that kept kept coming up. And it's also the kind of the area we, we work in where people um, have um, a business problem that's often quite vague. Like we want to improve um, the, we want to make our internal IT support team more efficient and reduce the time they spend um, replying to requests. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a natural machine learning or NLP tie in here, but it's not a problem you can take one to one and, um, you know, turn into a prediction problem. Like it's where you really need to think about what do I do? How do I break it down? And how do I reason about a, what the system should do, what makes sense and, um, what makes it useful. And I think that's, that's kind of what applied NLP thinking is about, like really reasoning about, um, the best approach um, for a real world applied context. And so I think in the post, I also kind of compare the, um, these two, like how and what um, points. So it's like, you know, the um, 
uh, this um you know the, the how like how to do a thing is stuff like oh um which you know implementing a machine learning model that's like of course something as an engineer it's important to know uh, training knowing about ml more generally um knowing python knowing libraries and then there's kind of is the what like what should you actually be doing and that's kind of that's really the hard part because there's no easy answer to that there's no not even really you know there's no course you can take and that's not something you can you can learn because also it's also very specific like it really you really need to reason and that's like stuff like when should you even use machine learning in the first place mm. that's, um um and you know yeah that, like there are a lot of you know and often for example we tell people like hey if they have a problem start by doing a baseline that's just like really simple even just regular expressions and like see how you go yeah. right? because that's what you need to beat like if your machine learning model cannot beat that you probably you either doing something wrong or you like it's really not a good use case for that because you're always going to end up with worse and less predictable results so um and that's actually that's yeah that's also a big part not everything needs machine learning that's something you don't really see in research because it's not this is not interesting like you you know you have a you faced with a problem and um you know input data evaluation data and you try and improve the accuracy score it's not an interesting academic contribution to say oh if i use regular expressions i get this score but um similarly oh if i just change the data i get better scores like yeah sure but um that's not the point whereas yeah. if you're actually working in an applied field like sure change the data make your problem easier um that's absolutely allowed like this um um and yeah and then of course also understanding what does the application do what should it output and what are the outputs actually used for will the outputs be shown to an end user will the outputs be shown to a human who then makes a decision based on that what outputs do we actually need um how fine grained do they need to be and that can also then influence the choice of components um that are used to best solve this like i think there's often you know it makes sense like we often as like humans we often reach for what's closest to what we can imagine um in our heads or we think of hey we have these support tickets for example and we want to know well what went wrong so a natural instinct is to say hey yes we will just like la um, labeling everything that went wrong as like a problem and then we're trying to see if a machine can predict that so at the end of it we can get out we can get out a representation from natural language support tickets to the other things that went wrong and then we can analyze them further and send it to the right support person um that's for example that's one option but then again for example, like ling linguistics come in, you start doing it, you often start, need to start doing it. You start labeling these things and you start realizing, ah, a lot of these things are actually don't even have clear boundaries. Like the computer doesn't turn on and the screen goes black or the screen goes black and it's all weird or something. Like mm -hmm. you you start like even applying your label scheme and your 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 logic that you have come up with and you realize, First, A, this is really hard. Um, there yeah. are no clear boundaries and a machine will likely have a hard time with this as well. And then even if you try training something, you get the outputs and you realize they're all arbitrary phrases. They all don't follow any consistent, any structure. Sometimes you have screen goes black. Sometimes computer won't turn on. Sometimes um, you just have a verb. They're, what do you even do with this output? Yeah. Not very useful. And so then you might think, hey, actually, maybe I should try just predicting a category over the whole thing and use multiple categories. Like this is the, I'm just using the example from the blog post, but um, they are like tons of similar um, cases that will come up in all kinds of different use cases where. Yeah, and when my mind goes sort of is thinking. when we're thinking what's useful and not to use there, like I, when you say something like that, I'm like, maybe embeddings would be something that would be useful useful for that maybe, yeah. maybe not but that's something that we could yeah. yep. could think about right and see what what brings most utility to a particular business question yeah and also and as you say, said before also the same model or the same trained artifact can be um really useful in one context and really terrible um or even harmful in another that's also why mm. i think you know when we're talking about um things like you know metrics 
to measure um, things like toxicity in language. Like this is, I, of course, this is very valuable if you have like a language model or your face, you, you know, you have these large models that produce arbitrary output and you want to put that in front of a human. Yes, it's definitely, you know, important to check like, hey, what are the implications and what what kind of language does it output and what lang what, what words does it know and um, how does it view those? Because, you know, the impact there can be really bad. But of course, um, you know, having a low toxicity score, that's that, that's not like a win or great thing in itself. Like if you are using these large language model embeddings in a system that say helps your content moderators screen uh, for potentially harmful comments and be quicker at like filtering them out of the queue, um, you want a model with very high toxicity because those are the comments um, yeah. you're interested in and if you don't have that or even in your support tickets or email filters you want that because otherwise your model might, might um you know hallucinate something else um exactly out of these very high never seen them yeah, yeah. And, and i don't know your your accounting department gets spammed with all the toxic emails you receive because the model hallucinates that they must be about accounting because um all the weird stuff was about accounting so they, they can be like, you know, harmful outputs on the other side and you can't, you know, they, you cannot solve this with technology alone. Like you have to sit down and reason about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a question yeah. of how as much as, yeah, cybernetics yeah. in some ways, how us humans and machines work together. Yeah. And I can't remember who it was. I think it may be Fred Turner at um, UC San Diego. I think he was there when he said this, that um, we need to figure out how humans and machines work together and machines are very good at doing things that, Create problems for humans as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And then also, I think the other aspect, or, how, or even if we, so if we surface something from a machine, uh, like a prediction to a human, whether it's internal or external, um, adding that level of transparency, like, um, mm -hmm. you know, showing even if you you have like your internal analysts at your company um, who then get uh, suggestions from a model, showcasing like, hey, this is suggested from a model. This is, um, you know, the probability. This is maybe some background on why. That's all important. I think in an, in a lot of applications, there has been this like weird idea that oh, you know, humans don't want to, uh, or like you you should just pretend it's magic and like you know not not tell humans anything about it. And I think that's that's wrong. Like even end users, even cu customers and consumers, uh, can totally understand that and work with a system that has a machine learning component um, that's transparent. Like you don't have to tell yeah. people, oh, this is just magic and the computer does it. It's like, nah, this is a model that predicted this with 80% accuracy, which is decent, but um, still means 20% of the time it's wrong. Exactly. So I'm interested, we've kind of circled around these things, but I'm interested yeah. in what, what from your perspective as a um, software developer, is what the biggest challenges cu currently in the NLP space are? Um, yeah, so we also, yeah, actually we do see a lot of that because we also have, uh, we recently opened up um, a services offering again, spacey tailored pipelines and spacey tailored analysis mm. because yeah, that was a direct response to that because A, we also wanted to be closer again to real world problems because th there's a lot that comes up and we kind of, we want to be users of our own software in order to yeah. make the software better, because I think that's often a problem if you are developing. And as you said, you built Prodigy using... originally in yeah. order to also solve to do yeah, your own, yeah. To, to do that. But then also, hey, we we so we're using our software, basically Prodigy, other things to solve problems for other companies and very specific use cases. And if we've actually we actually have a really cool internal document where we list like things, fixes, and improvements. I think we call them like collateral. Um, uh, um, fixes or something like that came up during working using our own software for other people mm. and realizing ah this is this is so inconvenient who wrote that ah shit us okay we need to yeah. fix that um, classic um, dog so yeah, right yeah. yeah yeah so that that's kind of that's the that, that's the context so we are seeing a lot of it we do actually and one thing that I was um, you know very excited by and that also kind of confirmed our view there is that spacey talent analysis which where we really offer to do the feasibility study and to help people like break down their problems, tell them what to do, tell them, um, you know, analyze the data, annotation scheme, all of these uh, parts that are really crucial and just really look at the project. Does it all make sense? Can it be solved? That this has been very popular. And I think that also speaks to um, the idea that, um, or like the idea we've had for a long time that, that 
often the, the really hard part is deciding what to do and how to break down the problem and yeah. goal into a machine learning pipeline, like yeah. which there are lots of different components, lots of different things, what to even use in the first place. And everything seems, seems kind of hard. Every thing, um, you know, seems very involved or like even what should I, it, it influences the data collection. It's kind of this, yeah, this cycle where you have this idea, come up with a label scheme based on that, label the data, realize, ah, maybe I need to frame this differently, try again. And um, kind of breaking out of that and really getting this head start on how should I approach the problem is often, um, yeah, often the, the one of the hardest parts. Um, and then of course, like there are hard parts along the way, but once you know what to do and have figured, like have confirmed that it works, the training itself isn't even that difficult anymore. Like it's not, you know, that's that's usually not the bottleneck. And then, then there's some experiments you can run to maybe improve accuracy slightly. But um, for a lot of these use cases, well, the majority of it will depend on what you're doing in the first place, um, uh, how, how good your data is and how good your evaluation is. So um, even that is like, once, once you have something that works, improving it um, is often quite feasible. And then, yeah, often if people ha already have a business use case or have like something they're doing, then even putting something in production um, can, it can be doable um, and at least the first step can work. But um, yeah, getting over that initial obstacle of like, okay, what, what do I, how, how do I start? Um, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's a big That's something challenge. we see a lot of as well. Um, so we did promise to chat about this and that we have had a bunch of questions and yeah. comments in, in, in the chat around uh large language models yeah um so as we know we discussed this before i mean you know you can't my mum asks me about <laughs> gpt yeah. and i if, if if my mum's asking me about something you know it's it's it's, it's out there um no i'm kidding my mum's actually quite quite savvy but a, a lot of my a lot of my friends are asking me about chat gpt and the future of labor and, and stuff like that and yeah so i with all this hype um around large language models i think you're in a fantastic position to help us reason through how large language models can actually deliver value in the world of NLP. Um, so I'd be interested yeah. to know how you think through it and whether you're using any at the moment and what your thoughts are. Um, yes, so we've, we've been, yeah, do, do, I can talk a bit about that later, what we've been working on, but um, so in general, of course, it's, you know, this, the developments are, um, yeah, even aside, aside from the hype and having to distinguish what's like, what's hype and what isn't, it's obviously very exciting to see these things work. And it also, mm. it's in a way, it's something we've kind of been waiting for for a long time. I remember be, really early on when we started the company, we were like, okay, back then it was like, what you could do is sort of word vectors and maybe slightly better word vectors. That was mm. the level of like, even just, you know, um, if you're thinking of like, oh, information extraction, like beddings, and then like, okay, there must be, a, right now we're not quite there yet, but there must be a way to retrain more to pre-train more layers and really um you know have a way to embed more knowledge about uh, the language and the word the world into a model because that's the big you know the, this cold start problem of like oh the model needs to learn everything from scratch that was usually really hard and then okay yep. with the yeah you know, transformer models that became much more doable even just using the embeddings um that was exciting and even now having the having the large language models being able to um, you know, make use of that. That's that's definitely exciting. I think it's also a very good, um, even though, yes, um, you know, having your like um, mothers and friends and grandparents ask about chat GPT and then having to roll your eyes and be like, yeah, no, it's not, it's not all like that. Um, it's annoying. It's for people in the industry, it's great because, um, you know, there's a renewed interest um, in NLP. And um, even though despite like, oh, the recession feels, it means that companies are generally quite willing to, um, you know, further invest in that area. And that also, even if, yeah, if you're working on, an, on an, a machine learning team, um, like, I don't know how well that generalizes across industries, but we've definitely heard that like, hey, it's now much easier for them to advocate to get like some funding and some staffing for the stuff they're working on when previously, before that, the mood was more like, now nah, we're cutting and AI was seen a bit more like, or NLP as like, ah, this is all this exploratory stuff. Um, let's like focus on the most important things. Now it's a lot easier for teams to, um, push their project 
so especially in large orgs, which yeah. obviously is nice, nice for for developers, and also it's nice for us as a company doing developer tools. So absolutely, um, that's just kind of the market context, and um, uh, yeah, more generally, as I said, we what we're working on a lot is information extraction, and there I think um, um, the actually more exciting. What I find more like it's obviously very impressive to see hey, ChatGPT, you put some something in, and it produces very impressive results given that it was not specifically trained to do the thing you ask it to do so that is um that's cool but i i, I often like to take this a step further what that, <clears throat> what i think that means is it's not necessarily that oh we just need to train bigger and bigger and bigger and even bigger models that can maybe finally do everything super specific that we want them to do instead it's more like imagine what this thing could do if you just train it on something really specific and smaller because you know you don't often need you know everything um on the internet <clears throat> but you could you know you can really use this in a more applied and much more specialized context where um yeah, yeah th that's so that's that's one of the takeaways the other is that well in yeah you know, in development um i think i mentioned this before you need a way to tell you always want to have a tell uh, to t have a way to tell the computer what to do and in some cases yes a natural language input prompt is a good way to do that and there are a lot of like customer face b2c b2c applications chatbots and so on where yes that makes sense people ask the question but for a lot of structured information it's kind of not like for you know it's it's not necessarily the best way for like you know an end-to-end -end, um application because then you know you end up in engineering these prompts and it's often much easier to say here's exactly what i want give me that um mm. there's currently a lot of kind of working around that and also again the out this the outputs are in a similar format and also not necessarily structured in the way um that you need them to be there's like it's it's very um it's very open but also that means that um there's kind of a lack of um of general structure which is part of <clears throat> part of the whole like um claim and a whole uh goal so um, I actually think where uh, large language models come in in a much more exciting way is if, if you take it one step further and think a bit, think past just, hey, language generation, I can put in a prompt and it tells me something. Um, you can use them as a tool in your development process. So one thing we've been working on, and I can also maybe share the link later or on, on your Slack, is um, annotation workflows using GPT-3 um, in Prodigy to help you generate data for a specific problem so you can leverage these models to generate text if you start out with um, not having very much data available you can give it some examples it can generate more you it can suggest the labeling it can su suggest a category for the whole text it can su su suggest um uh, subcategories or it can su suggest um spans of text with a label and then you can manually correct them because there are things that um, the model might get wrong and then create a high quality data set for a smaller downstream model um, very, very quickly. So that's mm. that's one use case that I think is very exciting and that we want to explore more. Also, given that it will only be a matter of time for the research community to produ produce open source models, smaller models that people can run locally, because that's obviously also a big, um, that's something that's very important for us with Prodigy, um, <coughs> the data privacy, um, people don't necessarily want or should send their data to random startups in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So um, people want to run this locally. Again, also ties back to the industries. If you work in finance, healthcare, um, often people need people work with their data on air gap machines that can't go on the internet or maybe have never exactly. really been on even been on the internet. Like that is a requirement, and I think that's important. I don't want. I wouldn't want like people messing with my health health records. Um, in like someone else's cloud, like that, of course, yeah. that's bad. So I'm, I'm all for regulation. So, but that also means how there need to be um, different approaches or things people can run locally. And I do think that will happen. So we're not dependent on these um, APIs. Um, then, yeah, another, actually another thing to say about ChatGPT, the reason ChatGPT is so good because they did annotation. Um, and uh, I don't know if like they, um, if you remember seeing this article, there was something about like what what did they pay them these the click workers two dollars an hour? That's that's obviously that's terrible. Um, mm -hmm. I um, again, it's like it's often for a lot of more specialized use cases. It's not about the um, you know the, the cheap click work. It's about 
the quality data. So, um, you know, if you have good tooling, if you have better tooling and a more efficient process, you can have in-house annotators label data for you and they'll just be faster um, yeah. and better. And actually even on the, yeah, on the, uh, yeah, th this leads me into but the final point I have about the large language models, um, or another point, um, which is, yeah, yes, if you're thinking of, like we often, now get questions about like, oh, uh, is GPT whatever going to replace all natural language processing or all NLP and all um, information extraction in companies? And um, I think one thing to think about is it's not what, what people are often really what companies are mostly interested in is a reducing variance and doing things better, doing something kind of OK, but cheaper is really not, often not an option and not attractive for a company like um yeah. you know it's like if you think about even tools you use would you would you yeah you know, yes sure there's a market for zoom that's um slightly worse or like kind of okay but cheaper um or slack or anything else any other tooling you use and any even your internal products sure there might be um might be a market for that but now what's really interesting is um better and of, and I would pay more if, you know, if there was a Zoom that was better, I would pay more for that. If I mm -hmm. could pay, <clears throat> if I get a lot of <clears throat> services and tools and even things we do internally, if I could just pay more and have it be better, I would do that. And I think that's also kind of the outlook um, we should have here. Um, and um, yeah, there's always, there are always ways to use these large language models to get to an experience, to get to an experience and a result that's better and that's attractive. But just replacing yeah. a whole workflow with a model that's like kind of good and that you've like outsourced. Yeah, that, that, that's not that's not where the value is. And in general, the the biggest value is delivered in things that are very specific to your use case, not necessarily something that's like very general and surprisingly um, great at that. Exactly. And that's actually a point you make really wonderfully in the, the post I've linked to the applied NLP thinking as, as well, but as opposed to research, which is about <clears throat> generalizing and finding general results and general truths about the world. Um, business is about specificity and solving specific yeah. um, problems. Um, so we have so many fantastic questions. We're not going to have time to, to get <laughs> to all of them, unfortunately, but there's one last one. So I'm going to link to Slack. If, if you have a question that we haven't answered, please do come and join our Slack to, to ask it. And Inez- Yeah, I'll, definitely, I'll be around. I'll answer every question. Um, awesome. But, but there is a specific question, which I think you'll like to talk about. Will Spacey <laughs> V4 be released anytime soon? And um, what new features will it have? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. So we are like, I don't know if you've been lurking our issue or like our pull requests, you see that we have a V4 tag. So it is, mm. this is in the works and, um, you know, and we're not, I don't usually like giving ETAs because, um, you know, it's always hard to predict um, what's happening, but, um, but yes, we are, our the team is working on space V4 and actually um, the features question is interesting because one thing we like to do with our, like with our open source projects or our software in general is we, we found that it's, it's often quite bad if a um, new version or new major version introduces both changes in the philosophy and the API. So you mm -hmm. have to completely rethink how everything fits together. And at the same time, you have to change all of your methods and or like not all of them, but methods you call and um, ways you do things. Um, and that's often very disruptive. And I think that keeps people from um, being able to upgrade. So that's also why in Spacey 3, we really introduced a lot of new conceptual ideas like we introduced a completely new way of training having a config file that records all defaults all settings being able to train just from that file um and it kind of a new mechanism for how the components work how you can you know have custom models in pytorch tensorflow um a lot of these things um, um around uh, the conceptual um yeah side of the framework so now for v4 what we want to focus on is making some breaking changes we did not get into um, V3. So um, that's that's one thing. So they are there are like a lot of convenience things that, you know, we've always wanted to change or also things that like, oh, we're a bit like, you know, frustrating in some ways where we're like, ah, but like, you know, we don't want to break the backwards compatibility. Uh, mm. So that's, that's one thing we're changing. I think we also, the library will be more lightweight. Um, we we'll are um, running a lot of cool um, experiments around um, transformers and distillation 
um, also to really you know deliver on that um, promise of uh, making the library um, uh, you know fast, efficient, um, being able to train these smaller downstream models. Um, finally, um, yeah, just efficiency improvements. I feel I feel really bad because I should have. This is I'm 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 not so prepared on this, and I feel like I'm I'm missing out on no, things. And this I'm, was a, this I'm, was a curveball <laughs> as well. So. Yeah, but, am I, but I'll, you can I'll tell us on Slack as well. Yeah, I will tell. I will. And, I will follow and, up with this on Slack, and I will. I, prom I will check back with Sophie, who you might also know from Spacey, who's um, mm -hmm. the team lead, and she will be able to tell me exactly um, what the plans are and what I forgot here. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for such a fun yeah, chat. You. We could talk for for hours more. So I hope <laughs> to. I hope to do it again sometime. And I'd. Just like to thank everyone who, who joined and everyone who asked all those great questions. As I said, we couldn't get to all of them, but any you'd like to ask in Slack, please, please do join us. Um, but once again, Inez, thank you so much um, for such yeah, a delightful Thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone. Yeah, I, I wasn't following the chat, so I didn't, I didn't see anything. Um, I was mostly, I was just kind of talking into the void, but yeah, thanks yeah. To everyone for showing up. Really cool. And awesome. I'll definitely be around on Slack, so you can ask me stuff and I'll type. Fantastic. Thanks, Inez, and thank you once again, everyone. Right. And